I welcome you to our Bible study tonight. I pray the Lord will bless everyone in his study in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. We bless your name because we know your spirit will expose, expound the word to everyone. And it will profit and benefit everyone, small and great, young and old, in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless all our newcomers. Bless all our members. Bless all our ministers. Bless everyone participating at the Bible study everywhere in Jesus' name. Amen. We bless your name because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we are coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and we are studying from verse 6 all through to verse 13. To start with, we'll read verses 6 and 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no man of you, no one of you, be puffed up for one against another. Verse 7, For who maketh thee to differ from another? Or watch as thou that thou hast not received. Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? That's actually leading us to what we're looking at tonight. The message tonight is receiving more grace beyond gifts and glory. The Corinthian believers had a lot of gifts. And the apostles said they had not come behind in any of the gifts, comparing them with other churches. But beyond the gifts, he needed more grace. The Corinthian believers were guilty of glorying in their accomplishment. He gloried in this and gloried in this and gloried in that. And they were full of carnal comparison. They thought they were better than such and such. They thought they were greater than other people, even within the church or outside the church. They gloried in vain. But the apostle was telling them, writing to them, instructing them as he is instructing us. And he's saying they needed more grace than the things they were glorying on. That's why we've titled the subject tonight, Receiving More Grace Beyond Gifts and Glory. If you come back to verse 6, it tells us in verse 6, it says, All these things that I instruct you about, that I give you admonition on, all the things that I'm giving you instruction about, I have transferred figuratively to myself and to Apollos. It says, I've been mentioning Paul, I've been mentioning Apollos, because we are ministers that ministered unto you. And I've transferred all the illustrations to myself, Paul, and Apollos, my colleague, my fellow worker. Because you need to learn in us, in the apostle and in the teacher. You need to learn in the pastor and in the teacher. You need to learn in the leader and the minister. Not to think of men above that which is written. The Corinthian believers fell into that trap. They were exalting men above that which is written in the word of God. How many people do that today? They abandon the word of God. They look at a man. They look at a woman. They look at a minister. They look at a leader. And they exalt that leader. 
and they exalt that minister above the word of God that is reaching. And they look at those ministers as if those ministers are their perfect illustration and the perfect doctrine. And they abandon what is reaching in the word of God with that kind of carnal comparison. I'm comparing myself with that minister. I'm comparing myself with that teacher. I'm comparing myself with that leader. With that kind of carnal comparison, the problem is they will not measure up to the word of God. They have exalted the man, they have exalted the minister above the word of God. His illustrations, his um, commandment, his admonition is greater than what they can read in the word. And Paul the Apostle as their teacher, Paul the Apostle as their father was bringing them back to the word of God that they may learn learn in us not to think of any man not to think of any minister not to think of any preacher above that which is reaching that no one of you be puffed up for one against another we look at verse 7 again it says as you look at yourself and as you look at other people if you think you're different if you think you're higher if you think you are greater, who maketh thee to differ from another? You've got grace who gave you the grace. You've got gifts who gave you the gift. You've got something that you are happy about and that you even glory about who makes you to differ. And if you think that you are higher than the new converts and you are greater than the other church and you are greater than other people that you believe that at the same time together was made you to differ, was made you to be different. And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? He said, even when you look at your secular knowledge, what do you have that you have not received? When you came into this world, you knew virtually nothing. You couldn't read, you couldn't write, you couldn't understand the meaning of the words that were spoken until a teacher was given to you. And the teacher instructed you, and the teacher taught you, now what you have is what you have received. And when you come to the Christian faith, salvation, you didn't have salvation by birth. You didn't have salvation when you came into this world. You've got salvation because an evangelist, a preacher, a prophet, a pastor, a leader taught you the word of God and revealed the word of repentance and salvation to you. So you've got salvation because somebody told you about salvation. You've got holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. Somebody taught you. You've got the power of the Holy Ghost, somebody taught you. You've got experiences in the Lord, whatever you have, what have you that you have not received? Think about the material things too, the material things of the world. You've got a house, you've got land, you've got certificate. What hast thou that thou did not receive? And if you look at everything you've got in the physical, Everything you've got in the mental, in your memory. Everything you've got in the natural. Everything you've got in the spiritual. You can ask yourself and you can answer the question, What hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, whatever it is, if you've got it from God through people, You've got it from God through your parents. You've got it from God through the teachers. You've got it from God through somebody here on earth. Why are you bragging? Why are you boasting? Why are you glorying as if you have not received it? He needed grace to be humble. He needed grace to be lowly. And he needed grace to be subjected unto the word of God and then to understand it must be full of gratitude for what they have got from the Lord. Receiving more grace, I pray that tonight every one of us will see ourselves as we ought to see ourselves. I didn't hear your amen. 
and then we'll plead and pray for more of the grace of God in our lives. I will receive more grace beyond the gifts we have and be beyond whatever we're glorying in. We're looking at that message, as I said, receiving more grace beyond gifts and glory. Three things we're looking at today as we study the verses from verse 6 all through to verse 13. Constant caution against pride, the pride of accomplishment. When we accomplish, that's good. When we succeed, that's good. When the Lord has prospered us, that's good. When we have this or have that, that's very good. When we're making progress, either in the natural or in the spiritual, that's wonderful. That's called accomplishment. And we need constant caution against the pride of accomplishment. Number two, Corinthians conceit and presumption without abasement. The Corinthians did not know anything about humility, anything about lowliness, anything about meekness. They did not have the nature of the lowliness of Christ and the meekness of Christ and the gentleness of Christ. They were full of conceit. They were full of pride. They were full of self-exaltation. They were full of presumption. They were full of hypocrisy. And that is why we're looking at that second point. The Corinthians conceit and presumption without abasement. Number, two, number three, commendable commitment and the proof of apostleship. The apostles, they conducted themselves according to the word of God. Those apostles, even though they were preachers, they were people that practiced what they taught. They lived by the word. They walked by the word. They interacted by the word. They comported themselves and they conducted themselves by the word of the Lord. They knew they were apostles every moment of the day and every day of the week. You see, there are people that do not understand that if you're an apostle, you're an apostle every moment of every day of the week, of the month, of the year. If you're just like you're a man, you're a man every moment, whether you're in church or you're at home, whether you're at home or you're on the street, whether you're on the street or in the office, the man is a man all the time. The woman is a woman all the time. An apostle must have the demeanor and the character and the conduct and the attitude of the apostle every time. It's not only when we're preaching, it's not only when we're praying, it's not only when we're counseling, it's not, not only when we're trying to show other people the way to heaven, whether you are preaching or not, whether you are sitting or standing, whether you're in the church or at home, anywhere you are, there must be proof of apostleship. If you are an apostle, if you are a pastor, you are a pastor all the time. If you are a minister, the way you conduct yourself and the way you interact with people, and the, whether it's private or public, the way you interact with people uh, who are on the opposite side, the way you interact with people, if you're a man, you interact with women, if you're a woman, you interact with men, everything you do, you are conscious all the time, this is who you are, and you ought to have the proof of apostleship, and there should be that commendable commitment to who you are. Point number three, then, is the commendable com uh, commitment and proof of apostleship. We're coming to point number one. In point number one, constant caution against the pride of accomplishment. We're coming to verses 6 and 7, 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 4. We're reading from verse 6. And these six brethren, brothers and sisters, members of the body of Christ, these six brethren have I in a figure transferred 
to myself and to Apollos for your sakes. It says the reason he taught was for their sake. And the reason he used whatever method he was using in passing across the message of life and the message of scripture was for their sake. He said that ye might learn in us. Every time we come before the word of God, we ought to learn. Something had to be added unto us. Knowledge, revelation, instruction, impartation has to be added unto us. If we come to the study and we learn nothing, if we come to the worship and we learn nothing, if we come to the revival hour and we learn nothing, and nothing is added unto us, we have wasted part of our lives. But it says, all days I'm teaching you. All days I'm instructing you that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is reaching. When you listen to the word of God, your response is not, what a great teacher. That's not your response. Your response is not, what a great knowledge the preacher has. That's not your response. You learn not to think of the main. You learn not to think of the ministers. You learn not to think of the preachers above that which is reaching and that no one of you no one of you, whatever your status and whatever your situation and whatever your experiences, that no one of you should be uh, popped up for one against another. Then he asked that question that we asked before, and that's in verse 7, for who make it thee to differ from another? And watch as thou, that thou didst not receive now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Three things we are looking at. Number one, condemnation and guilt for being puffed up. Condemnation and guilt for being puffed up. Number two, and it's a consideration of the giver of all our possession. Whatever we possess, natural, supernatural, physical, spiritual, personal, or in the family, whatever it is, we need to consider who is the giver, who has given us what we possess. Number three, caution against vain glory over other people. Caution against being glory over other people. Look at number one, condemnation and guilt for being puffed up. As you look at verse 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of me above that which is reaching, that no one of you be puffed up, puffed up, puffed up for one against another. As you look at those words, puffed up, it's like swelling up, swelling up with pride. The head is swollen, the mind is swollen, and in their esteem, they esteem themselves greater, higher, bigger, more knowledgeable, more important than every other person. They carry themselves with an air of pride. And they looked around and they belittled everyone. And they acted as if they were all in all, popped up. That was actually peculiar to the Corinthians. Look at verses 18 and 19. In verse 18 now, some are puffed up as though I will not come to you. That's about them again. Corinthians, everywhere they were, people could see that air of pride and they were full of self. In verse 19, in verse 19 it says, but I will come to you shortly. If the Lord will, I will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. Did it have the power? Did it have the skill? 
they didn't have the ability they didn't have spiritual quality and yet they were puffed up though they were powerless look at chapter 5 verse 2 in chapter 5 verse 2 and ye are puffed up there was um, terrible uh, immorality in the midst of the Corinthians and yet ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned they were puffed up no repentance no conviction of sin they have lost the sensibility and they have lost the conviction of this is right and that is wrong but it was still puffed up yeah puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you look at chapter 8 verse 1 in chapter 8 verse 1 now as touching things offered unto idols we know that we all have knowledge we all have knowledge but the problem was the children those the corinthians they had knowledge and they can quote chapter and verse of the bible but as to whether this is expedient or not that they could not judge as to whether this is right for the believer or not that they could not judge that's why paul the apostle said knowledge perfects all but charity edifies when you consider what you are doing you consider what you are what we are eating you consider where you are going on how will it affect a brother or affect a sister that's uh, what edifies your charitable but knowledge perfect all in chapter 13 of first corinthians verse 4 when you have love the love of god and charity charity suffers long and is kind charity envies not charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up that was the major problem of those corinthian believers is that your problem that you're always thinking of yourself my good look my beauty my knowledge my certificate, my experiences, my position, my authority, my power, my knowledge, puffed up. The Lord is saying, we need grace to be humble and then to jet his sin and to cast out everything that is of pride that makes anyone to be puffed up. Look at number two here. In number two, there's the consideration of the giver of all our possession. For us not to be popped up, we'll consider who has given us what we have. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, the first part, for who make it de to differ from another. You are saved. Another one is not saved. Who makes you to differ? you have education you've gone to college you've been to university the other person cannot trick cannot write there's no reason to be proud for who make it d to differ from another you have a marriage you have children another person has married and is still looking up to the lord there's nothing to be proud about for who make it d to differ from another you've gone to college and you have job another person has gone to college too he doesn't have a job for who make it d to differ you've got land you built a house the other person of the same craft of the same profession and of the same age of the same church he has not got land he has not got a house there's nothing to be proud of for who make it d to differ whatever you have got and the other people have not got and you're making canal comparison and then you're raising your shoulders and you're raising your eye your eye your face and you're raising your personality and then you're bragging everywhere that's mine that's mine watch out that's pride for who make a deed to differ from another and what as thou that thou didst not receive we need to consider who gave us a possession but reading from john chapter 3 in john chapter 3 reading from verse 27 it says john answered 
and said a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven always consider that you think you have a good brain i will thank god for the good brain there are people in the village that have as much iq as much brain as much uh, mental ability as you have but you know they are in the village and they are not exposed to what to expose uh, what to what you are exposed to and it is god that has given you the opportunity that you have in fact when you think about everything you didn't choose your parents you didn't choose daddy or mommy you came to this world through daddy and mommy and all they have provided for you all they have done for you that makes you to be where you are today it is because of the grace of god the lord orchestrated that and the lord planned that a man can receive nothing except it be given him from above and now you come to the church they are born again another brother is born again another sister is born again that brother is as spiritual as you are that brother may even be more spiritual than you are but in god's own doing you happen to be a leader and the other person is still a member it doesn't mean that that member is not spiritual this is just the gift of god that a man can receive nothing except it be given him from above always consider that that all the good things you have they are given from above in james chapter 1 reading from verse 17 james chapter 1 verse 17 every good gift you have any good gift every one of them and every perfect gift you have any perfect gift at all every one of them every good gift and every perfect gift is from above is from above always consider god is the giver always consider that christ is the originator of every blessing you have every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and coming down from the father of lights with whom with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning it tells us in first peter chapter 4 verse 10 First Peter chapter 4, we're looking at verse 10. And as every man has received the gift you have received, you have received, you didn't uh, create those gifts, you didn't originate those gifts, you didn't uh, make that gift to come without its coming through God. And every man, every man has received the gift even so minister the same one to another even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of god let's make sure that we have grace in everything we have everything we do and in all our interaction let there be no pride and let there be no statement like hey i'm the one talking to you you know who is talking to you? You know my position in this church? You know my authority in this church? Do you know what I can do? And do you know that if I say you will not be this, you will not be a hold on. Everything we have is not coming from you, it's coming from God. And whatever God will give anyone, you cannot hinder let pride be buried forever and ever there is nothing to be puffed up about and there is nothing to be proud about you minister and you give and you interact in loneliness and meekness as every man has received the gift it tells us in Hosea chapter 2 verse 8 Hosea chapter 2 verse 8 for she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for bail. They did not know this is a gift coming from me. And because of that, they acted 
as if they were the originators of everything. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 3. In Isaiah chapter 1 verse 3, the ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's creed, but Israel does not know. As Israel did not know, the Corinthians did not know. As the Corinthians did not know, many Christians, so-called today, so-called Christians, they too, it's like they do not know that this gift and this grace and this possession and this skill and this ability and this opportunity, everything is coming from God. The ox knoweth not his owner, and the ass his master's grief. But Israel does not know, my people does not consider. I pray the Lord will give every one of us the grace to consider the giver of all our possessions in Jesus' name. You can say a better amen than that. Amen. Number three now is the caution against being glory over other people. The caution against being glory above other people we're looking at first corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 the second part of verse 7 now if thou art, if thou didst receive it why dost thou glory as if thou art not receive it it says if you have received it from god Whatever that thing is, from salvation to all the privileges and service that we have today. Whatever that thing is, from a little certificate, primary school certificate, to graduate certificate. Whatever it is we have, it wants us to be cautioned against being glory over other people. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 29, First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 29, that no flesh shall glory in his presence. That's it, no flesh, no man, no woman, no believer, of course, no sinner, and no saint, and no servant of God, that no one, no man, no flesh, no member of the church shall glory in the presence of God. We come to the presence of God with gratitude. See what God has given me. Like, like a Jacob, I married nothing, and I, I went through this uh, river, having nothing but a staff in my hand. I come back now with two bands because of the provision and the possession I got from God. No flesh should glory in his presence. Even Paul the apostle saying, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I'm not even meat. I'm not suitable. I'm not fit to be an apostle because I persecuted the church but by the grace of God he called me and by the grace of God he gifted me by the grace of God he has given me the opportunity I have caution against being glory over other people in chapter 3 of first Corinthians verse 21 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21, Therefore, let no man glory in men. Don't glory in yourself. Don't glory in other people. Don't glory in denomination. Don't glory in religion. Don't glory in anything. Therefore, let no man glory in men. For all things are yours. As salvation is yours, salvation is available to the other one too. As sanctification is yours, it's available to the other person too. As your privilege of ministry in the service of the Lord, it's available to other people too. It's of grace that nobody will be proud. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. It tells us in First Corinthians chapter nine, verse sixteen. Chapter 9, verse 16, it says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. What does that mean? They call you a pastor, I preach the gospel, there is nothing to glory of. They call you an evangelist, I preach the gospel, there is nothing to glory of. They call you a leader, they call you a minister in the household of faith, 
that means for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glorify or uh, to, uh, to glory of. Your father, your mother, praise the Lord, but there's nothing to glory of. And they call you whatever, a professor or a professional, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Paul the Apostle said, I cannot glory in preaching, it's of necessity. It is laid upon me. I have to do it. If I don't do it, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the knowledgeable man glory in his knowledge. Let not the exalted man glory in his exaltation. Let not the possessor of whatever or whatever it is glory in his possession. Thus says the Lord. It's the watch of the Lord to everyone. He wants us to be meek. He wants us to be lowly. He wants us to be humble. God exalts the humble and the abyss the proud. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. You have power, you have skill, you have ability, you have strength, you have health, you have vitality. And you have what it takes to make you strong and be running without getting tired. That's the gift of God. We cannot glory, you cannot glory over other people who are weaker. Other people who are like maybe sick or fun. It says, let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. It tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 26. Verse, uh, that's Galatians chapter 5, verse 26. Let us not be desirous of being glory. Let that thing be purged away from your heart, purged away from your mind, purged away from your character, purged away from your system. Let us not be desirous of being glory, provoking one another, envying one another. We'll come to point number two now. And it's about the Corinthians conceit and presumption without abasement. We're reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 8. Now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have ye have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God ye did reign that we also might reign with you. In verse 9, for I seek that God has set forth us the apostles last. As it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to the angels and to men. In verse 10, we're fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. And we are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Here, Paul the Apostle was writing like a father using ironic language to children and saying, oh, you've got it all. Oh, you have arrived. Now you are a king. Now you are reigning. Now you have everything. And then we are nothing. You are not even considering us. You are not considering who has brought you into the kingdom. You are not considering what has helped you to have the knowledge of what you have. You are not considering what has opened to you the way of salvation. 
you are not considering who has opened the door into the inheritance of eternal things. Now you can go ahead, now you can run, now you can possess all things without us. Look at that verse 8 as he speaks to them. He says, now ye are full. They were not full, that's what they thought. Just think you are full. Okay, now you are full. And now you are rich. You think you are rich and you have need of nothing. They were not rich. They did have everything they ought to have. They were like the Laodiceans who said we're full, we're rich, and we have need of nothing. And yet they did not know that they were miserable, they were blind, they were poor, they were naked, and Christ had to counsel them to come from to come down from that throne of pride and to come in humility in the sight of God so that they can have the real riches coming from heaven. It says he have reigned as kings without us. What do you think about that? You've run ahead without the apostle. You've run ahead without the teacher. You've run ahead without the one that shows you the way to have everything you ought to have. And now you think you are reigning as kings without us. And now Paul the apostle said, really, I would to God, you did reign. You are not reigning. I, I would to God, I wish it were real. I wish it were for real that we might also reign with you. Look at three things there. Number one, self-satisfied, exaggerated esteem of the arrogant. They exalted themselves, they were arrogant, and they had self-esteem, and it was all, all self-satisfied exaggeration. Number two, sincerely expressed evaluation of the apostles. Now the apostle was going to evaluate, and he evaluated them, and he sincerely expressed that evaluation. Number three, self-sacrificing eloquent example. The example of the apostles, eloquent. And the lifestyle of the apostles, eloquent, that spoke volumes beyond what they could think about. The self-sacrificing eloquent example of true ambassadors. Look at number one, First Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 4 verse 8 self-satisfied exaggerated esteem of the arrogant now ye are full now ye are rich ye have reigned as kings without us and i would to god ye did reign that we also might reign with you look at revelation chapter 3 verse 17 is similar to what the Corinthians were saying and Christ told the church in Laodicea the members of that church even the ministers in that church the leaders in that church and all the various arms of that church because thou says I am rich thou says that's what they said and increase with goods that's what they said and have need of nothing. That's what they said. They said, like Esau, I have everything. No birthright, I have everything. No hope of heaven, I have everything. No witness of the Spirit of God, that they were children of God, I have everything. No victory over self, no victory over sin, no victory over temptation. I have everything. No power to prevail against all the challenges of life, and yet I have everything. The same thing with the Corinthians, and the same thing with many so-called Christians today that think they have everything. They do not have valid testimony of salvation. They do not have continuous, constant victory over sin, over self, and yet they say, like the Corinthians and like the, like the Laodiceans, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched spiritually and miserable spiritually and poor spiritually and blind spiritually and naked 
Look at verse 27. The danger of thinking you have need of nothing. And the danger of thinking you have each all when you actually have a great need. In Proverbs chapter 27, verse 7. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 7. The full soul loses an honeycomb. The full soul loses an honeycomb. What that means is somebody is full even when he has taken junk. He has taken what is not nutritional. He has taken what is not actually providing strength and health for the body, but is filled up. Then he will lose the honeycomb. When you bring something nutritious, when you bring something edifying, when you bring something that will build him up, he despises that because he thinks, I am full, I have no need of nothing. But to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. To the one who is hungry, he devours everything. He wants everything. He desires everything. The Lord is saying, we shall climb down from the, from the ivory tower of pride. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 11. In Isaiah chapter 13, verse 11, And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. Those who are proud, I don't need salvation. I don't need restoration. I don't need redemption. I don't need forgiveness. I don't need cleansing. I'm all right the way I am. I am a good member of the church. Everybody knows me. I'm better than so and so. I'm better than such and such. That's being arrogant. And the Lord said, I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. And I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. In First Samuel chapter 2 verse 3. First Samuel chapter 2. We're looking at verse 3. It says, talk no more so exceeding proudly. Talk no more, act no more so exceeding proudly. And let not arrogancy come out of thy mouth. Like the Corinthians, like the Laodiceans, like the proud people of the world, let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. He knows everyone. He knows the level of everyone. He knows the emptiness of the proud. He knows the vanity of the vainglorious. The Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed by him actions are weighed number two we're coming to the sincerely uh, expressed evaluation of the apostles we're coming to first corinthians chapter 4 reading from verse 9 the sincerely expressed evaluation of the apostles it says in first corinthians chapter 4 verse 9 for i think that God has set forth us, the apostles last, as were, as each were appointed to death, we face persecution, and we face, we face injurious situations, we're endangered every time, and we've chosen that kind of life because we are preaching the gospel and because we're going to do the totality of the will of God as if we are appointed unto death. For we are made a spectacle to the world and to angels and to men. It tells us in Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 29. Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 29. For unto you it is given on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake persecution, misunderstanding, oppression, whatever the world will do, whatever men will do, it's been appointed unto the believers as well as unto the apostles. In verse 30, verse 30 says, having the same conflict, the same persecution, the same affliction, 
the same suffering, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. He said, we go through everything, affliction, persecution, suffering, and we do that voluntarily, we do that cheerfully so that we will go through whatever is appointed by the Lord. In First Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 3, First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, no man should be jolted by these persecutions, no man should be surprised by these oppressions coming upon the apostles as they were ministering, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed there unto verse 4 it tells us in verse 4 for verily when we were with you we told you before that we should suffer tribulation that's not the great tribulation we should suffer persecution we should suffer affliction we should suffer from the negative actions of the people that do not believe the totality of the gospel we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass and you know and now was you come to first corinthians uh, chapter 4 reading there from verse 9 first corinthians chapter 4 verse 9 it says we are made spectacles spectacles unto the world spectacles unto the angels and spectacles unto men that means that the world is watching and the world is watching what we're going through and they might say if he is righteous why is he suffering so much persecution if he is holy why is he so is uh, suffering so much misunderstanding it says we're spectacles to the world and christ had won us that that will happen in john chapter 15 reading from verse 18 john chapter 15 verse 18 if the world hates you you know that it hated me before it hated you and then in verse 19 it says if you were of the world the world will love his own but because you are not of the world but i have chosen you out of the world therefore the world hated you the world is watching and the world is running after us it's not that they want to believe they want to accept they want to embrace everything we have they want to persecute they want to show their animosity they want to show their hatred they want to show their brutality and their cruelty it says that's who we are we apostles and we pastors and we preachers and we teachers of the gospel were exposed to the world and were spectacles before the world then it says even before angels look at first peter chapter 1 verse 12 in first peter chapter 1 reading from verse 12 unto whom it was revealed the angels were investigating the angels were searching, the angels were looking at the glory of Christ that will come and the suffering and the result of the suffering of Christ when Christ will die and redeem us from our sins unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the holy ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into who are the people that will be the heirs of salvation the angels desired 
to look into that who are the people that will have the benefit of what Christ will give at Calvary the angels were desirous looking into that who are the people that will be so exalted in fact even though they are men when they get to glory they will judge the angels who are those people the angels were desirous to look into them and the angels were watching those apostles and those preachers and they were moving on not caring for persecution not caring for all the indignities that were done against them and the angels were surprised that these are the men proclaiming the gospel of the lord we are made spectacles to the world and then to angels and to men in ephesians chapter 3 we're looking at verse 9 ephesians chapter 3 verse 9 and to make all men see the men are waiting those who are not saved they are waiting for the word from us to get the word of salvation those who are saved and they need to move on to the second work of grace sanctification they are waiting to learn from us they are men they are waiting to learn from us the word of righteousness and holiness and sanctification and those who are saved and sanctified they are waiting is there any other sin left the power of god the power of the holy ghost to come upon their lives and those who have got all that they are waiting for the revelation that we're going to reveal unto them them. and we apostles and preachers who reveal the mind of God were made spectacles to men and to the world and to angels it says in this Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9 and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by jesus christ let's come back to first corinthians chapter 4 verse 9 we're looking at the third part of that now that's a self-sacrificing eloquent example of true ambassadors the apostles were ambassadors of christ those prophets and preachers they were ambassadors of christ those pastors and teachers they were ambassadors of christ and the example they showed was an example of self-sacrifice. They didn't hold on to anything as so precious. They didn't hold on to anything as so important. They didn't hold on to anything as something so indispensable. If I don't have a car, I cannot live. If I don't have a house, I cannot live. If I don't have material things, I cannot survive. If I don't have, uh, you know, the respect of the people, appreciation of the people, I cannot be sustained in life. They didn't hold on to anything. They sacrificed everything. The self-sacrificing example of those true ambassadors. That's why Paul the Apostle said concerning himself, concerning other apostles, concerning Apollos, concerning other ministers of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake. I was satisfied. We are fools for Christ's sake and we're happy about that. We are fools for Christ's sake and we take pleasure in that. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. He said, number one, we're fools. Number two, we're weak. Number three, we're despised. But that's our choice and we decide we're going to follow Christ in spite of the persecution in spite of being put down in spite of being thrown away in spite of being rejected in spite of not being respected and honored we have chosen that we're fools for Christ's sake what did he say he was rejoicing in that look at first Corinthians chapter 1 verse 27 in first Corinthians chapter 1 verse 27 but Christ has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise he said that's why we're happy if we were wise in ourselves God will not choose us if we were very much intelligent too intelligent to be submissive unto God the Lord will not choose us 
but he has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty if we were strong in ourselves like you Corinthians are trying to be and you are trying to a uh, kind of flex your muscles and trying to show everybody how strong we are how powerful we are how mighty we are God will not use you, and God will not do anything good with you. He cannot use the people that are full of themselves, or the people who are weak. He has chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty. In verse 28, he tells us why he has done that, and base things of the world, and the things which are despised, as God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. And then he tells us about the fact that you are strong, but we are weak. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And then in verse 9, the Lord said, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Remain foolish, my grace is sufficient for thee. Remain weak, my grace is sufficient for thee. Remain under that situation of being despised and rejected of men. My grace is sufficient for thee. Remain under the persecution and under the discredit of the people of the world. My grace is sufficient for thee because for my strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly therefore will i rather rejoice in my infirmities that the power of christ may rest upon me when you are not strong in yourself when you are not overconfident when you are not self-confident when you know that if any soul is saved by your ministry it will be the grace of god when you know that your skill your ability your strength your knowledge your revelation all that cannot save a single sinner that it is the holy ghost himself that will walk through you and take your foolishness and take your ignorance and take your lack of ability and take your lack of skill and take your witness and then you Use that weakness to impart the lives of people and to bring them under conviction and to lead them to the grace of God that makes you happy that all your strength all your ability everything you claim is coming from the Lord look at verse 10 it says in verse 10 therefore I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches in necessities in persecutions I take pleasure in everything I take pleasure in distresses for Christ's sake look at this for when I am weak then am I strong when I am weak in myself then am I stronger in the Lord when I am foolish in myself then am I wise in the Lord when I am nothing in myself, then I'm able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Then he talks about being despised in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading from verse 28. It tells us, and the base things of the world and the things that are despised the things that are despised you know there are times when i believe them and they do so familiar with you like your siblings brothers and sisters of the same family they will not say is that they will say is that not my brother is that not my sister is that not so and so that's how they despised jesus christ when he came to nazareth where he was brought up they said is that not the carpenter's son and because of that they despised him but is the savior 
and none of those uh, brothers and sisters in the families none of them became savior he is redeemer he is lord he is king and is going to reign forever and ever in spite of the despising by the members of his family maybe you are like that they say i hear you are a pastor now I hear you're a preacher now. I hear you're an evangelist now. I hear you're this and that now. And then they laugh. Uh, they remember when, what you were when you were in the secondary school and how you used to be together. And they never thought a person like you would be a preacher of the gospel and you are despised. But you know what God has done? The Lord has taken the best things of the world and the things that are despised as God chosen. Yea, the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. I pray God will make us to remain and abide under the great and the mighty hand of the Lord in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now, commendable commitment and a proof of apostleship. We're reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 11. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place, like the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 12, and we labor, walking with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, we don't throw the stone back at them, we don't send it back to the center, to the sender. They revile us. We don't revile back. They use unprintable vocabulary against us. We don't take that same terrible word and throw it back to them. Being reviled, we're blessed. Being persecuted, we suffer it. And then in verse 13, being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the fields of the world and at the obscuring of all things unto this day. Here the apostle is talking about their apostleship. He's talking about the proof of apostleship. Maybe there are people that, you know, in their pride, the pride of ignorance, in their ignorance and pride, they're saying, uh -huh, be careful what you do to me, I am an apostle. And if I say this, that this will happen to you, you will understand the authority and the power of an apostle. That's not the proof of apostleship. But told in these verses, there's no bragging, there's no revenge, there's no retaliation, there's no throwing anything back at your enemy, there's no cruelty, there's no brutality. And there's no fighting against the people who have fought against you. If you're a real man of God, if you're a real minister of God, here is the proof of your ministry. Here is the proof of your apostleship. Here is the proof that you are called of God and you remain at the center of the will of God and the calling of God. Three things. Number one, loyal servants, productive despite poverty number two laboring servants profitable during persecution number three like breaching servants like breaching other people persevering against pollution look at number one loyal servants productive despite poverty one preacher many years ago said to the congregation in my presence he said once if i don't have the kind of car i want to ride i'll give up the ministry why should people in the world ride this kind of car and then i will ride anything lower than that he said i have told god i'm in the ministry because i know you're going to do this for me you are going to do this for me and once that does not happen i'm off the ministry i go into business and raise money for myself that's not an apostle that's not a preacher called by the lord according to the word of god servants of god are loyal servants 
and they continue being productive despite poverty. Look at that verse 11 in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 11. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. You know, there are people that are looking for promise from the Lord. Lord, I know you are calling me. I know you want me to be this or that. I know you want me to be a minister. Let's strike a deal. Let's make a bargain. What are you going to give me? What am I going to become? If I'm going to become this, this, and that, then I will. The Lord is not going to respond to such people. The apostles said to this present hour, to this present moment, is the great apostle that God showed great revelation to that has brought the word of salvation and the word of holiness and the word of righteousness and the unsearchable riches of Christ is brought that to the church and is brought this redemption to the people of the world and he said we're willing to be hungry and we're willing to be thirsty and we're willing not to have all the clothes we ought to have and we're willing not to have even accommodation of our own a certain dwelling place but we'll still keep on serving the lord i pray you'll keep on serving the lord seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness don't mind whatever you have whatever you don't have in god's own time in god's own way he will add all these things unto us in jesus name look at philippians chapter 4 verse 12. philippians chapter 4 we're reading from verse 12 i know both to be abased and i know both how to abound that's a, that's an apostle that's a prophet, that's an evangelist, that's a pastor, that's a teacher. He says, I know, I condition my body, I condition my mind, I condition everything I've learned. I know how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need you must make up your mind you're not dictating to god oh god okay i want to serve you where will i serve you i want to be a pastor but on what local church are you going to place me how many members do they have there they have up to one thousand up to three thousand before i can be a pastor there or is it just a new location a new local church and you only have a few people there uh, if that's the way i cannot do that then i'll go back to my business i was a successful businessman before and uh, you called me i'll go back to business and raise money okay you can go back god cannot use people who are dictating to him paul the apostle said i have learned i'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry to abound and to suffer need. number two in number two we're looking at laboring servants profitable during persecution profitable during persecution there are preachers and pastors they are working they are laboring they are ministering in places where there is persecution and the faithful pastors they abide there the faithful pastors they remain there they are not writing to their friends in other places. I hope you are praying for me. There's persecution here. Uh, I, I want to leave this place. You pray that God will work it out. I will leave this place because of persecution. My brother, who is going to minister to those people there? Christ died for the people there. And Christ died for everyone. And he's not willing that those people shall be lost. And those people shall perish. He wants somebody to go there, to be there. Preaching to them, to show them the way of salvation. If you are praying and sending prayer requests, uh, please pray for me that, you know, so God will take me out of this place. And somebody else who is not as good as myself. Somebody else who has not as valuable as myself myself somebody else who has no is not as knowledge was not as important as myself will be sent there what kind of prayer is that 
that's not of God. That shows lack of commitment and lack of sanctification in the sight of the Lord. We're laboring servants and we're, we're profitable during persecution. That's why Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12, and labor, we're laboring, working with our own hands, being reviled, we're blessed, being persecuted, we suffer each. That's ministry. Hey, there are people that will say, I don't enjoy the ministry. There's so much rejection. There's so much persecution. There's no respect. They look down on me. They despise me. They revile me. They pick holes in everything I do. And they find fault in everything I do. I don't think I can continue ministering to those people. Paul the Apostle said, that does not bother us. We labor. We work with our hands. We revenge, we keep on and we're blessed. We're persecuted and we suffer it. It tells us in um, First Timothy chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 10. First Timothy chapter 4, we're reading from verse 10. But therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach. It says, we want people to get saved. We want them to come out of sin and come into the kingdom of God. We want to be used of God in those difficult places, in those dangerous places, in those places of, uh, of despising. They don't appreciate preachers. They feel that uh, preachers are those who have nothing else to do. They are failed in business. They are failed in the academics. That's why they are coming to preach. They say all, say all sorts of things against preachers. We hear yet we remain and we abide because without the preaching of the gospel how will they be saved that's why we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living god who is the savior of all men especially those that believe Tell, look at number three now. Number three is the liberating servants uh, by persevering against pollution. They were liberating others, were helping others to come out of defilement, out of degradation, and were helping them to come out of pollution so that they can be pardoned, they can be forgiven, salvation can be theirs. Although they count us, they defame us, and they insult us, and they, they disgrace us, all the same, we don't, they cannot run us away from the ministry. It is those who are afraid of suffering, those who are afraid of rejection, those who are afraid of persecution that run away from the ministry. And it's not only from the ministry. There are people that run away from their teaching profession in their school because, you know, the, the children, the students are teachable, they are ruling, and we cannot manage them. I cannot, you know, suffer all that. I cannot have heart attack because of teaching. And, you know, those children, they run away from the teaching profession. There are people that run away from the medical profession. There are people that run away from every, any other thing they are doing because they cannot bear the heat of the day. But the apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, being defamed, we entreat. We are made the field as the field of the world. It lies against us. And, uh, you know, in the early church, those uh, unbelievers, uh, they will say, those uh, people who say they are Christians, they are cannibals. Because of the Lord's Supper, they accuse them of eating the flesh of Christ and of drinking you know, the blood of Christ. They said a lot of things against them. They said they were not social people. They were not friendly people. They will not eat the sacrifices of those idol worshippers. They reject everybody. They are the holy, holy people. They think they are better than everybody else. They cast aspersions on them. And they made them the fields of the world. It's like, and then the obscuring of all things. 
you understand that word of scouring when you have cooked and then what you have cooked is a bunch under is bunch in the in the bowl that uh, you used in cooking and then you take something to scrape that's the bottom of uh, the container what you bring down there that's the ops carina that's what they called those apostles they said they are refraps they're useless people they are dirty people they don't fit into anywhere in fact i cannot even take them to be a servant in my house i cannot take them to be a, a worker in my own a profession in my area they look down so much on them and paul the apostle said that's all right that's all right you don't respect us god appreciates us heaven appreciates us and the angels of god they're even envious about us and we know that we're going to have a great a crown and stars in our crown we're turning many to righteousness that's not your stop that's not your deal you don't appreciate that but we know what we're doing and we know where we're going and because of that they did everything they did joyfully I pray you'll be joyful in the service of the Lord in Jesus name being defamed when preach were made the fields as the fields of the world and were the upscouring of all things now I've already told you we don't throw back all the arrows that people throw at us and look at first Kings chapter 13 verse 6 Kings chapter 13 verse 6 it tells us about this man of God and the king answered and said unto the man of God entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again what had happened is the man of God prophesied and then that king said take hold of him and his hand dried up there are some religious people today they say that's good for him you'll know we're real prophets of god you'll know we're real servants of god and then they'll walk away and they'll pray oh god let that hand remain dry until he dies then they will know who we are but you know and the man of god besought the lord and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before being defamed we entreat they were helping and they were praying for and they were lifting up the people that persecuted them and look at lamentation chapter 3 we're reading from verse 45 lamentation chapter 3 verse 45 thou has made us as the offscouring and the refuse in the in the midst of the people and then in verse 46 it says and our enemies have opened their mouths against us that's what paul the apostle was saying the persecutors and the enemies of the gospel they have opened their mouths to insult those men of God. Look at verse 52. In verse 52, it tells us the attitude of those enemies. My enemies chased me so like a bird without cause. In verse 53, it says in verse 53, it says they have cut off my life in the dungeon you remember paul the apostle they put him in the dungeon you remember paul and silas they put them in the dungeon but they didn't they were not sorrowful they were not regretting what brought me to this how could i continue like this they sent praises unto the lord and here in lamentation we're told they have cut off my life in the dungeon and cast a stone upon me you remember how they stoned paul the apostle he didn't give up the ministry because of that in verse 55 he tells us i called upon thy name O lord out of the low dungeon in verse 56 it says thou has heard my voice had hide not thine ear at my breathing at my cry and then in verse 57 it says thou doest near 
in the day that I called upon thee, thou saidst, fear not. And that's exactly what God did to Paul the Apostle. Look at the way Paul the Apostle continued in um, we're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26 and verse 22. Acts chapter 26, we're reading from verse 22. Here is Paul the Apostle. He's not going to give us a summary of everything he had done and how he continued and he continued being profitable and he continued progressing and he continued persevering and he did not mind all the persecution all the assault all the insult and all the affliction he continued in the things of the lord and in the way of the lord and he's giving that as an eloquent example unto us and he's giving us exhortation by that example and what has happened to you that happened to me too what are you facing i face that too what pressure do you have i had that pressure too and what difficulty difficulties and dangers have you gone through i've gone that through too but i continue and you will continue i said you will continue give me a good deeper life amen, amen. look at your bible now acts chapter 26 we're looking at verse 22 having therefore obtained help of god i continue unto this day and you should be able to say that that whatever has happened whatever water comes under the bridge or passes under the bridge you should be able to say yes insults yes persecution yes affliction yes degradation yes they call us the fields of the earth of the world and they make us the offscouring of the world yes there is all the defamation and there is all the persecution all the same have been obtained of god help i continue unto this day witnessing both to small and great and saying none other things than those which the prophets and moses did say that that shall come that christ will suffer and through his suffering will have salvation they've shown us the example people like paul like peter like john on the isle of patmos like all the prophets of god in the old testament like all the preachers and pastors and teachers in the new testament they have shown us the example that in spite of persecution in spite of the problems in spite of affliction they continued in the grace of god they continued in the service of god i will continue you will continue we will all continue the grace of God in the service of God in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and open our mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer and tell the Lord we'll continue, we'll continue, we'll continue. We'll do the will of God, whatever people do, whatever people say, however people act, whatever the persecution, whatever the affliction, whatever the assault, whatever the insult, however difficult or dangerous, however that situation may be in that locality, remain in that church, remain in that region, remain in that state, remain in that service, remain in that ministry, and offer your very best unto God every moment of your life, all the days of your life. Open your mouth and have grace, have grace grace of grace beyond the gifts and the glory. We've listened to the word of God tonight, and it is very revealing, expository, challenging, and probing. And if we should examine our lives in the light of the word of God, and we have seen whatever areas that we have picked up the nuggets of gold in the word of God, 
And we have seen those areas in our lives that we need to make amends. How I pray that the grace of God will grant unto us the humility to come before the cross and to ask God for grace in this hour of need. The question is, is there anything for you to be proud of? Of course not. What have we got that you have not received? If therefore you have received it, why then do you glory as though you have not received it? Everything that you have gotten, in fact, we came into this world with absolutely nothing. Anything we have now is clear profit. And God is the owner. God is the one that has given unto us the privilege to have whatever we have privately, in the office, in the church of God, in the ministry. Whatever talents, whatever abilities, whatever gift that we have, they are endowments. They are endow Even the skill... The training and the skill that comes after the training, they are all by the grace of God. The privilege that we have in the ministry, ability to preach and, and, and to have a public, a public ministry in this church, they are all privileges. And all we need to do is to be humble. Paul Apostle was such an example of humility. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 9, it said that I will get, we, are, we, are, we are the least of the apostles. In Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8, he said that we are even, and uh, uh, he said that uh, 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 he was a saint. He, he brought himself down from apostleship to being a saint. And as if that was not enough, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15, he said that we are the chiefest of sinners. Moving from apostle to being a saint, so being a sinner, that is humility. He was growing in the grace of humility. How I pray that we will grow in such area also in the name of Jesus Christ. And the challenge is there. And the grace of God is available. That we can be like Paul the Apostle. We can pattern our lives after him to grow from whatever may be the level of achievement that we have. And not to think about ourselves but to think about the abundant grace of God that has given unto us to have all this bestowed upon us. We brought nothing to the world and clearly we take nothing out. Whatever we have now is only by His grace. I pray that the grace of God will be as, uh, uh, sufficient unto us in Jesus' name. We also saw the suffering of the apostle. He was more or less comparing himself with the, with, the, with, the, with the Corinthians. Okay, now you can now claim that you are, you are rich. You can now claim that you are strong. You can now claim that you are wise. And he was using a, a kind of a figurative expression for them. More or less like saying figuratively, now that you can claim that you are rich, but remember where you started from. Now you can claim that you are, you, are, you, are, you are wise. Remember where you started from. All this wisdom, all this additional accretion into whatever you have done, abilities and gifts, whatever, remember who gave them to you. Now we are ready to even submit ourselves, subsume ourselves under you. That was what a Paul Apostle was telling them. And that was why we, we should also look at whatever we have. There is nothing to compare about. The grace of God should be enough for us, in the, as we have seen in the life of Paul Apostle, to know that whatever we are, we are what we are by His grace of God. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10 says, I am what I am by the grace of God. From being an apostle, I am what I am by the grace of God. Am I a teacher of the gospel? I am what I am by the grace of God. I am, am I an apostle or am I a preacher? Am I an evangelist? I am what I am by the grace of God. And that grace of God was sufficient unto him to the extent that he even suffered. He suffered. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 23, Are they ministers? Yes, I am. Are they apostles? Yes, I am. Are they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are they preachers? Yes, I am. Are they Hebrews? He now wondered. It appears I'm get I'm boasting more than anyone. So I am. In fastings of one, in perils of water, in perils of the sea, in perils of fellow countrymen. Thrice, thrice he received 39 stripes, five times, three times or five times he was shipwrecked. 
in, 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 in the night in, 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 in hunger and thirst yet he labored and as if those things were not enough the administration of the churches he said that apart from those things that I suffered I still had to oversee the churches who is weak then I'm not weak who is offended then I burn not that was Paul the apostle the example, the, the iron constitution and uncommon consecration of Paul Apostle, that is the example. When you claim this deeper life, I don't know, it's, the question you should ask yourself is, to whom does our Father in the Lord pattern his life after? Everybody will agree with me, it is Paul the Apostle. Then why are we complaining? If he is the apostle, <laughs> patterning his life according to the life of Paul the Apostle, then we have no more to complain at all. The grace of God is sufficient. We only need to ask for the grace of God and we give us that grace abundantly as we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. And the grace of God is unfathomable and, un, 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 and inexhaustible. However much of grace you take, you can never exhaust it. Why not go now to the throne of mercy, to the throne of grace, to ask, uh, to the, ask for this grace in this hour of prayer and God will grant unto us in the name of Jesus Christ. This, by the grace of God, I said it, is a cut above others. The ministry called Deeper Life is a cut above others. And when you come into any club or association, you must know the rules and regulations. You must know what they stand for. We stand, by the grace of God, for the commitment and consecration to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the level at which any of us is operating, we should recognize that there is a, a, a level we can even climb higher. And in conviction, in commitment, in consecration, in service to the Lord, without batting an eyelid, the grace of God is sufficient. He will see us through. I say he will see us through. God will see us through in the name of Jesus Christ. And whatever, you are, whatever may be the heat of the day you are, facing in the ministry I can tell you what wipe your tears the, the cloud will clear and the brightness of the glory of God will shine back into your life in the name of Jesus Christ I said it will shine back into your life in Jesus name let us call upon the name of the Lord open your mouth and pray the grace of God that's all we need whatever comes whatever go whatever goes we need the grace of God and this grace of God is abundant this is God is unfathomable. This is God is inexhaustible, and it is available tonight. When you call yourself a deeper life, you must have the registered stamp on your on your on, on, of conviction on you. Deeper life, a cut above others, a cut above others, a cut above others. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. We are going to tell the Lord, you can look up in faith unto God now and ask him, God, the grace you granted unto Paul Apostle, grant unto me, O Lord, in Jesus' name. And he will do it. I tell you, he will do it. In the name, if he could give it to our Jesus, he will give it to you also in the name of Jesus Christ. Open your mouth and pray. I will not complain anymore. I will not grumble anymore. Whatever comes, whatever goes, in the heat of the day, Whatever may be the, 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 the challenges of the ministry, the challenges of being a Christian, in these attenuating circumstances that we are in the world, God Almighty will say you true. You set your face like a flint, and you know that this is what you have settled for, and we are talking about deeper life convictions. Deeper life convictions in the name of Jesus Christ. The spiritual this, the, 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 we are talking about the strong, the discipline and spiritual leadership that is the distinctives of the palai, the distinctives of the palai, strong, spiritual and, the, uh, and disciplined leadership and Christianity that is clear, a cut above others, but we grant unto us the grace to stand and to stand firm till the end in the name of Jesus Christ, all apostles suffered you know as well as I do, a lot of it, Second Corinthians chapter 6, and then also Second Corinthians chapter 12, he told us about the suffering that he went through, but in spirit in it all, in it all, through it all, he was able to stand until the end. Ask God, the grace of God, all that we need is the grace of God. You don't need to compare yourself with another. 
what level have you got and you have plateaued? No. Come up higher. Come up higher. Come up higher. There's always a room for improvement, whatever the level, until we come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Until we come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God is able to take us to that level. Uncommon consecration, iron constitution, that is what we see us through. Open your mouth and pray. Open your mouth and pray. Don't be, don't be desolate. Don't despair. Don't, 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 I don't have any cause for regret for being a church like this. Whatever it is you are going through, others have gone through before. And they are, we are, they are of like passions as we are. And they went through all this. We are not resistant unto blood. Here we are still, by the grace of God, still standing. And we have the relative peace and also the freedom to worship God. And that freedom, and that freedom is still there. Nobody has always put on the stock, nor put your necks on the, on, the, on the stock in order to cut it. So we are still having the great... If in this... Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 5 If you run with the horsemen and the, if you run if you run in, uh, uh, with the, and the weary what are you going to do in the day of, of, of battle? Open your mouth and pray If you run with the footmen and the weary day when are you going to what then will you happen when the conditions are tougher? This is the day we can serve the Lord. This is the occasion we have to, to, to serve the Lord, to worship the Lord, to be true to our convictions, and to uphold those convictions so that the people of the world will know that these people are of quality. In Acts chapter 2, from verse 1, he said that those of them that the way they conducted themselves during the early church, those of them that were outside, they saw their example. Ah! And they knew that these people have they are totally consigned their lives unto God. And because of them, fear came upon even the outsiders. Fear. Because they saw what was happening in the early church. They had their bread with signals of heart. And they were continued in prayers, breaking bread from house to house. And those of them were outside, they, they saw the example, they were attracted unto that example, and they came into the church. And the Lord added to the church such as should be saved. They can, then we see our example, and you think that we are not backing down, we are not backing off, we are still putting our shoulder to the, to the work, and whatever may come, whatever may go, we are still affirming the standard operating procedure of deeper life Christianity. They will know that these are for real. These are for real. The, the, the disciples of Lord Jesus Christ, they threatened them. If they, were, if, they were, if they were holding on to falsehood and error, the way they threatened them, they would have run away. They threatened them, they stayed. They threatened them, they stayed. In Acts chapter 4, verse 23, they came to their company and they raised up their head. He said that we are not asking that these people should die, but God give us the boldness that we will be able to preach the gospel. And in divine affirmation from, from about their prayer, the ground shook in verse 31. That is deeper life Christianity. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We knew we were going to have something wonderful. And you did not disappoint us by using your servant in order to, in order to inject us with the power and the fire of inbred, inbred, to inbreed in us the spirit of God, the power of God to be able to stand in stability. I pray, Lord God, in heaven, that spiritual stability will continue to inculcate in our lives in Jesus' name. The automatic stabilizing power of God grant unto us in Jesus' name. Natural uh, shock, natural, uh, 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 shock absorbers, ab absor spiritual shock absorbers to absorb whatever is coming from the world. Grant unto every one of us in the name of Jesus Christ. So that whatever comes, whatever goes, we know that we are set our places like flint. 
we are focused on heaven and uh, no distraction or meandering will take us from the path of glory in the name of Jesus Christ. And many of us as our ministers of the gospel by your grace, I pray that the spirit of God will come to well up in every one of us to know the, the, the commitment that is necessary in this hour of need in Jesus' name. I pray that the grace of God will be sufficient unto every one of us in Jesus' name. The power of God will rest upon us in Jesus' name. The glory of God will shine upon us in Jesus' name. The mercy of God will flow into our lives in Jesus' name. The Spirit of God will abide with us all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. We want to thank you, Father, King of glory, O Lord. We pray that as we go now, your presence will go with us. Your spirit will go with us. We are taking, O Lord, a, 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 a strength and commission from the headquarters. When we go to our various locations, Father, that strength will not be watered down in Jesus' name. I will not be watered down in the name of Jesus Christ. And the power of God will come to rest upon every one of us all the days of our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, King of glory, O Lord. Blessed be thy name. In Jesus' name we pray.